Hi. You're only getting Chris Hedges tonight. But thank you. I just want to acknowledge in our audience um, Fraser Pennybaker, our producer, executive producer, um, Rosabel Morella, producer, and I'd like to welcome up Stephen Wise. How did this uh, project come about? Um, well, it came about because uh, Steve was interested in somebody possibly filming his adventure that he was about to undertake with his cases, and um, he uh, mentioned it to a law student in one of his classes, and his sister was Rosabel, who came to us and asked us if we'd like to do a film about Steve, and we met Steve. and. Um, we thought what he was about to do uh, was just so intriguing and novel and uh, decided to see if we could start with him. And that's kind of where we like to be when we begin films is at the beginning. Situations that were for exhibition rather than other situations that might have been animal testing and things like that, would have, which would have also been captivity, but maybe even abuse and captivity. Sure. Um, did, did people hear the question? No. 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 Yeah. Uh, let me board it down. Uh, <laughs> you want to know why we filed on behalf of chimpanzees in the state of New York in a non-medical captive situation. Yeah, why, why did we focus on those that were just being used for exhibition that mm -hmm. rather than other situations which might have been even worse, for example, like medical testing for Lyme's disease or something like that? Okay, well I'll just get to those one at a time. Uh, the reason we filed uh, on behalf of, of the specific chimpanzees is that um, after uh, Reba and Merlin died, we decided that we had a moral obligation to identify and fostered on behalf of every chimpanzee we could find. And indeed, two of the Hercules and Leo were being um, enslaved in a research laboratory, not even for biomedical research, but for something that we considered to be nearly frivolous, uh, which was uh, uh, trying to uh, see, uh, trying to learn how um, humans learn, learn to walk, how, how the evolution came that they that we learn to walk with a straight leg. <coughs> uh, make sure people understand we're not anti-science. I have a degree in chemistry, so I'm certainly not an anti-science. Uh, but we thought that imprisoning little little chimpanzees, little guys, at from age three uh, to age nine in the in a cage in the basement of a building for six years was was wildly inappropriate. And uh, but that's what you can do when you're dealing with slaves. That's what you can do when you're dealing with things. You do whatever you want to them. So that's why we chose chimpanzees. You know, we in fact, we uh, found to them how to everyone we could find. Why we chose the state of New York? Um, it took us seven years to research you know, hundreds and hundreds of questions uh, as trying to narrow down which of the 50 states plus D.C. and the Virgin Islands and 10 other, other countries or 20 other countries. We finally chose the state of New York because we saw cases that made us realize that the courts of New York really valued a common law writ of habeas corpus. They thought it was really important. They had used it uh, at, at well when, when uh, slaves in the, in the antebellum north in the state of New York had filed suit. So they had used the Somerset case that I had written a book about, uh, and it was, it was indeed part of the state of New York. And then there were a few, a few really good things we liked about how they saw the writ of habeas corpus. One was that, I think I may have said, was that uh, we understood that this was the first time anyone had ever done this. And the odds of us making a mistake, or the odds of the judges making a mistake, or both of us making a mistake, were really high, because no one had ever seen this. So this, the state of New York allowed us to file writs of habeas corpus again and again and again. There's no such thing as, 
what, what we lawyers call res judicata, in that once you file suit, you can't file suit again. There's a remarkable exception with respect to writs of habeas corpus, and that allows us to keep filing. So what we had intended to do was to file if we lost, we would regroup, see if we could fix it, we'd file again. If we lost then, we'd regroup, see if we could fix it, and that's what we've been doing. So we've now filed suit uh, six times, and uh, we're not finished. And uh, um, someone's going to give up, uh, either us or the judges of New York. So uh, it's not going to be us. Yeah. So uh, we'll just have to see uh, and see what happens. So did, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm curious in your own words, uh, why is it that the uh, empirical scientific evidence alone isn't enough to move things forward? Well, yeah, so why isn't the empirical scientific, scientific evidence alone enough to move things forward? Well, when, when you're filing a lawsuit, you have two, two problems. You have the law and you have the facts. So the first thing we have to do is, pers is persuade the court that they should not think that the legal standard for personhood is being a being human being, that person and human being are not synonymous. And judges, believe it or not, um, many of them may, may think that. They understand corporations are also persons, but when they start thinking about natural persons, those who aren't artificial like, like corporations, they, we think that many of them, like everyone, maybe people in the audience, but maybe not this audience, uh, instinctively feel that persons and humans are the same thing. So we have to go in and try to disabuse them of that right off the bat, the best we can. That's the first thing we are in our, in our memoranda. And then we have to give them another kind of standard. So the kind of standard that we've been giving them is the idea that an autonomous being of any kind, of any species, uh, ought that, that Autonomy in any species ought to be a sufficient condition for rights. We don't argue it's a necessary condition, but we're saying it ought to be a sufficient condition. So if we can persuade a court that that is so, then we have to bring in the scientific facts that demonstrate that chimpanzees are autonomous. One of the, in the Lavery Court involving Tommy, that court threw us a curve saying, well, for the first time in any court that we've ever heard of or ever, ever read about or seen, a court said that, that you, you had to be able to shoulder duties and responsibilities. Uh, and then they said that chimpanzees couldn't do that without a single fact in front of them. No one knew they were even going to talk about that. No one ever talked about it. They essentially took judicial notice, which you can do about something that's certain. For example, we wouldn't mind if a court said, we take judicial notice of the fact that today was Wednesday. <coughs> or the sun's going to rise tomorrow. But when they take judicial notice of the fact that chimpanzees cannot shoulder do these responsibilities, that was really wrong. And so we then spent the next five months going to Jane Goodall and going to other experts, and, and then we have refiled a case that is 60 more pages of affidavits in which they demonstrate that chimpanzees can indeed shoulder do these responsibilities both within chimpanzee communities and within human chimpanzee communities. And that's been sitting on Justice Jaffe's desk now for about three weeks. And we look at our email you know, every 90 seconds to see if she's, <laughs> if she's issued a decision. And if she rules in our favor this time, we will go in and we'll pick up the <coughs> where we left off. If she rules against us and says, I, I just am bound, I'm sorry, I'm bound, then up, up we go to the appellate. Maybe, like, do they have any idea, like, any comprehension on the subject, 
You bet. Uh, and and uh, let me think of, of something that was on 2020, about uh, 15 or 16 years ago. Roger Fouts, uh, used to, from who was the uh, who worked with sign sign using chimpanzees at the University of Oklahoma, and then went to Central Washington University, uh, was eventually separated from the chimpanzees with whom he worked as a graduate student, and those chimpanzees were sent to a horrible horrible biomedical research laboratory called Lemsic in New York. And it no longer exists, thank goodness. And 2020 then decided to bring Roger, Roger back. And, and you can look it up on, probably on YouTube, and you can see Roger looking like he's in scrubs and operating scrubs with a mask. And he goes in to see the chimpanzee that he, who he hadn't seen in 15 years, I don't think. As soon as he comes, and this chimpanzee is in a little cage, has been treated a god awful way for many years. He looks up, he sees Roger, and he gives the sign for Roger. And Roger gives his name sign. And then he says, Key out. And that's the way I ended my first book. I, I couldn't think of anything else. That that would, that, any better way. Now, what, what was your first question? Well, the first part? The dolphin. About the dolphin. Yeah. Alas. Um, Indy did not do that, um, and, and Indy did not give rights to dolphins. What they did was issue a statement that gave dolphins protection and, and abolished, essentially, dolphinariums. And within that statement, they said many cetacean specialists believe that dolphins ought to have rights. But they don't say that they agreed with them or they didn't agree with them. They simply said that others believe that dolphins should have rights. That may be a hint, though, that they're beginning to lean in that direction. And India has been, has been handing down some remarkable cases in the Indian Supreme Court over the last uh, two or three years. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, why not include dogs in, in, the, you know, in the group of animals that, that you're advocating for? Uh, it seems that you know, so many humans have such rich relationships with them. And then there's something to say about duties and responsibilities that they do have within our society, like keeping us safe from bombs at airports, or you know, many of them are instrumental in treatments of diabetes and, and even cancer to, to humans. Um, so why not include them? Well, we looked at those non-human animals who we thought uh, would have would fit three criteria. One was uh, that there's been an enormous amount of scientific research done done upon them. Uh, as of the time I wrote about dogs in, in a book I wrote, Drawing the Line, I believe there had been, uh, since 19, the 1920s, there had been about six cognitive experiments on, mm -hmm. on dogs compared to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chimpanzees. There's been a few more now, but there's still there still aren't that many, but what we're seeing is looking good for, good for dogs. But, but if, we have, uh, if we have about you know, six or 10 or even 20, 20 articles versus we, you know, hundreds of them, I think now in the papers before Justice Jaffe, she probably has citations to six or 700 articles. So it's, re it's really overwhelming. So then what the um, research shows is that the cognition that they have is extraordinarily complex. And that simply hasn't been found yet in dogs, though we're certainly, I think, leaning in that direction. But it's, but it's not there yet. We lawyers, when we see something, we're thinking of what can we prove in court? How are people going to come after us? How are they going to undermine our experts? What kind of experts are they going to bring in? We thought dogs were not yet at that point. Uh, also, we couldn't sue under the common law problem because because uh, dogs are uh, there's a lot of statutes that regulate dogs but there really aren't statutes that regulate chimpanzees so we'd have to uh, try to sue under a statute that made a dog a person that it, or a, sta a statute that used the word person to argue that the legislature intended to include the dogs which is really an uphill battle uh, we have we are already in a bunch of uphill battles and we, we try to we try to uh, have us and the judges agree with as much as we can and just try to focus in on those things that we don't agree on and then bring in as overwhelming evidence as we can on that. And the third thing is that the sort of, the, of um, 
cognition, the extraordinarily cognitively complex abilities of chimpanzees and other <coughs> elephants, cetaceans, is also the kind that we recognize is in, within ourselves. So we, we believe that that might <coughs> be and others empathize with chimpanzees or with elephants because the kind of autonomy, especially the autonomy, but the, but the kind of complex cognitive abilities they have is like the, or is the same kind of co complex co cognitive abilities that we have. And so that would be one reason that would make it harder for judges to say, well, dogs aren't like us. So we're trying to argue, at least begin with non-human animals, we can argue are the most like us. We realize that, we're, that we are um, filing speciesist lawsuits, but the law is speciesist, and right now we have to deal with the way it is and uh, try to change it you know, and, and, and as we go, and we're committed to doing that. But first we have to persuade judges that we have to begin the process of moving any non-human animal from the category of thing to the category of person. Uh, I have a question for the filmmaker. Um, you know that the montage towards the end where it, you used all the clips of the different news people and the journalists that, and it kind of really felt like, oh, okay, this is the end of the film because we're winning. Like it really, I started to get wrapped up in that and, I, and the thought occurred to me with the you know, the, the quote of this is really just the beginning, the end of the beginning, and it's not even the beginning of the end. How did you as a filmmaker take this huge, huge journey that, that he's going through, which is obviously not even remotely finished, how did you create a framework for your story, how you were going to start it beginning, middle, and end, and how it was going to finish? Can you talk about that? Uh, the question was how did we structure our story from beginning to an end and deal with getting to an end? Basically, um, that was a real challenge. Um, it always is in real life stories, and you know, I, I always think of them, you know, kind of as detective work, like the making and filming processes, kind of trying to find the story, and then you get back all this material, and then you try to, you know, make a story out of it and see where it goes. This story had the additional challenge that it was ongoing, and it still is ongoing, and you know. Um, I'm waiting to hear what Judge Jaffe says as much as Steve does because you know we're really caught in it too. But I, I think um, you know the challenge for us is, is you know, is theater making theater out of this and making it understandable, especially the court cases, which initially we thought were going to be okay. There'll be one court case on one animal, and then as you can see in the process, it ended up. Um, Steve filing on every chimpanzee you could find, which meant we had three court cases, uh, very complicated for access, getting into the courts, um, very complicated explaining, you know, what his court case was and what the three different decisions were. But um, you know, that's the challenge that we have as filmmakers, um, and you know, hopefully, it should work for you. If I may say, I I kept asking Penny, what. For four years, I kept asking him what this film was about. He kept saying, you tell me. <laughs> so we have time for one more question. And stop Thank you for a wonderful film. I, I learned a lot. Uh, my question was, in the beginning of the film, you, you referenced and just touched upon the uh, meatpacking facilities. And so my question is, is does your organization work with um, making the meatpacking facilities more humane for the animals that are going to be sent to the market? No. Uh, we. Uh, well, there's, there are um, there are probably five, literally 5,000 humane organizations in the United States. But if you, if you count uh, uh, humane societies, little humane societies, uh, there's only one organization in the, in the United States who's working to get real legal rights for non-human animals, and that's us. And so uh, we are start. We have to, we have to start at a certain place. Um, we know if we ever bring our first cases on behalf of cows. Sheep and pigs, and the judge thinks that if she rules in our favor, everyone has to be a vegetarian. We might, we're not going to win. Let me put it that way. Well, I'm not saying become vegetarian. I'm talking about having the facilities take better care for the animals in the slaughter. Stuff. HSUS, PETA, and Jack, there's a lot of organizations. Farm, farm sanctuary. That's what their job is. Our job is to smash through this wall okay. and and start bringing animals from things to persons. And so. 
They do their job and we do ours. Thank you.